Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bennett and I'm the director of the United Nations Environment Program uh, at H1 India, uh, where we'll be discussing uh, issues of shipbreaking and the environmental impacts and the social and economic impacts that it has. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Bennett and I'm the... I'll be talking to you today about the uh, process of writing and creating draft resolutions and uh, working papers throughout the process of the committee. Uh, so feel free uh, throughout the presentation if you have any questions to send me a message. Um, if you have any questions specifically about the topic or if you have any questions uh, about my, uh, my, the topic of my committee, uh, then feel free to let me know. And just to begin, my email is also uh, unep at h1india.org. So I know that in uh, previous broadcasts, you've already discussed a bit about uh, what parliamentary procedure is and how debate flows throughout the committee. Um, and if you need to know more about that, feel free to email any of the directors and we'll be happy to clarify. Uh, so draft resolutions are basically the documents that come out of the end of that debate and really summarize uh, the debate uh, toward the end. Uh, thank you for your question about formatting a, work, a working paper. I'll be getting to that in just a second. So basically the draft resolutions and the working papers are how you summarize your debate and how you essentially publicize it to what would be the rest of the world in this uh, simulation that we create. Uh, so they, they emerge as a uh, function of the debate, essentially. Uh, I just want to add a brief note about the use of technology. There's been a number of questions about when it's appropriate to use technology. And of course, the major time when you do use technology in uh, the committee is to create these working papers and draft resolutions. So the, the rule there is basically that uh, there's no technology usage allowed during moderated caucuses, uh, but that during unmoderated caucuses, when you're free to walk around the room and talk with other delegates, um, you're welcome to have a computer out and be jotting down some notes on your working paper or draft resolution, for example. Uh, Excellent. And that's really the perfect environment to be working on creating these uh, draft resolutions and working papers is, you know, with people separate from formal debate, making sure that all of the sides are heard, making sure that people who may have differing opinions on the topic are able to separate out appropriately um, and be able to work on that. Uh, so generally the way that the committee is scheduled, you'll have just regular debate for the first three committee sessions, three committee sessions out of six. And then by around the third or fourth, and this depends on your chair's opinion, uh, you'll be allowed to submit working papers. And working papers are the initial summary of what uh, your uh, stance on the topic area is, basically. So, these don't actually have to have any kind of uh, formal structure or format to them. Uh, they're essentially a summary of your current ideas and current uh, stance on the issue. Uh, so I'm going to be working on creating an example here. Uh, so if you guys want to come with me to this uh, this link that I'm trying to put in here. If you remove the spaces, let me know if this shows up or not. Uh, it should be tinyurl.com slash UNAP2015. So if you take the spaces out of that, I think it should uh, be able to work and you'll be able to follow along with me. Uh, so I've put up an example. This would be United Nations Environment Program uh, Working Paper 1.1, for example. Uh, and so what we'd have in this is, you know, something like, this committee recommends the reduction of carbon emissions, 
supports the uh, smooth transition to renewable energy. Wishes to this is a working paper example. Support developing nations in environmental action through the following. So again, there's really no formal uh, structure that these working papers have to have. They just have your ideas down um, in a way that can then be communicated to the committee. And so what you do is when you have a working paper ready, um, what you do is you bring it to the dais at the front, um, submit the working paper. Uh, the director will then read through the working paper and the first thing they will do is let you know if they have any comments and any additions that they think should be added to uh, the working paper, essentially. Uh, and then once that has been, um, those any of those edits have been done, the working paper uh, is ready to be submitted. Uh, the director will let you know when it's been printed in some capacity and uh, it will be brought for everyone to read. And then typically there, there will be a little bit of a pause in formal debate. Uh, so you'll be removed from uh, the normal flow of debate and there can be a question and answer session briefly, uh, is what a lot of people will do when they're running a committee. Uh, and the question and answer session will uh, be an opportunity for everyone who contributed to the working paper to answer questions that people have. Uh, and this is this is a very important part of the debate because it sort of shows uh, not only you've, you've learned a great deal about what people's opinions are on the topic to begin with, but this is really where you start to see where they're going to side on the topic area, um, if they're going to go one way or if they're going to go another way um, and be able to. Uh, yeah, so the link that I'm referring to, I just posted above. I'm not sure if it showed up. I'm trying to go to http colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash UNEP 2015. Did it, is it, can you see the above message? Or is it centered? I might not be good enough to trick this to show you what the uh, what the link is for the Google Doc that I'm working on. <laughs> oh well. All right. Where was I? All right. So this is where. Ah. Okay. That makes sense. So. I need URL. How about that? If you, if you put all that together, then you should get it, I think. Uh, okay. So again, once you've had the introduction of the working paper, and it's just sort of a, a summary of uh, what your opinions are on the topic, uh, then there will be more debate following that. So you should also include a summary of the topic. So global. Oh, great. Someone's joined us on the page. Okay. Uh, global carbon emissions, the topic. And we also have some signatories or people that support the working paper. Those would be like Greece, Iran, USA, Russia, Somalia, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an example of what a working paper can look like. Really simple, really straightforward. 
And then over the next two or so committee sessions, uh, the goal will be to uh, take what you have here and formulate it into a formal draft resolution. And so the draft resolution has a series of uh, formal sections uh, that will go through. The most important is three sections, basically, you know, the heading uh, and then the preambulatory clauses and the operative clauses. And so I'll go into more detail of what those are uh, in a moment. So draft resolution example, I'm just, again, putting this all on the page, um, which you guys, I'll leave up and you guys can access it later just to see what we covered if you missed uh, the broadcast. So this would be United Nations Environment. This is draft resolution 1.1 topic. So global carbon emissions, you'd have signatories. Uh, so at all of the HMUN conferences, it's a policy that we have that we don't, some of you may be used to having sponsors on your uh, draft resolutions and working papers. Uh, but uh, at H1 India, we only have signatories, so it's expected that you know the people who contributed, um, they will they will know that they have contributed and they will step up when it's time to talk about draft resolutions and working papers, as opposed to having to be formally declared as a sponsor. Uh, and so that means that we only have signatories, and what signatories are are basically just people or countries rather that want to see this uh, work put before the committee. They don't have to support it. They can intentionally, you know, say they want to put it forward just so that they can argue against it. Um, so it's just, if you want to see it on the floor, you could be a signatory on anything, is the policy that we work from, basically. Right, so you have your heading here. You've got topic, global carbon emissions, signatories. And so then what happens after that is we get into the uh, preambulatory clauses. Uh, and so those are basically provide context for what you are um, writing uh, in terms of, you know, what is the history of this issue? And this is something that you've gone through and or will go through and find in most of your uh, position papers when you do research is sort of figure out what is the history, what is the context for this issue that I'm learning about? Uh, and so all of the words that you use to begin the preamble preambulatory clauses are uh, in the subjunctive, sort of uh, reminding, uh, noting, uh, those, uh, yeah, what are some other words? Uh, reminding, noting, stressing, encouraging, uh, remembering, for example, all of those words are things that you can, are ones that you can use to uh, explain what the, um, explain what the past history or context for the issue is. So you can say, and these all, when you're writing it on the computer, these should all be uh, formatted the way that I'm formatting them currently. So you underline the, uh, the, the word at the beginning saying, reminding countries, and again, this is gonna be a little bit shorter just because I obviously, a full one would be quite long and doesn't isn't really necessary to demonstrate what it should look like. So reminding countries about the damage that carbon emissions can cause, and then you separate these with uh, commas. So I'll have a comma and then return uh, noting the past recommendations of the Kyoto Protocol. So this is sort of, you know, acknowledging a specific stance of the committee on the science of this issue and then saying, you know, there's been this past uh, uh, piece of legislation published about the issue. Um, Okay, great questions. We have a request to discuss Q&A and also voting. I'll get to voting in a bit, and I can also discuss the Q&A some more. Great, great questions. Thank you. Uh, so noting past recommendations in the Kyoto Protocol and uh, acknowledging...
acknowledging needed support, support needed for developing nations. So those kind of give you context for the issue. And again, this will change and look different depending on uh, whichever uh, committee you're in and what the topic is exactly. Great, so once you've gotten to the end of your preambulatory clauses, uh, you begin to move into the operative clauses. And so this is where the real, uh, the real substance and the real meat and potatoes, of, if you will, of your uh, work in the committee is going to be. So these are enumerated uh, sections. So you'll have operative clauses one through However many, you know, typically I, I've seen anything between 10 and 30 of these. Again, your, your committee director will have a certain uh, number that they'll be uh, expecting you to, or not, well, not expecting, but they'll probably have a limit on how long uh, they want the resolutions to be just so that they're really, you know, concise and to the point, um, but still are able to communicate effectively about the issue, essentially. Uh, so the words that you use in the operative clauses are all active and present. So uh, encourages, for example. So encourages, and again, you underline the words at the beginning, countries to reduce their level of carbon emissions. And these are all separated by semicolons, so the, the dot above the comma there. Um, uh, supports the cause of helping developing nations to transition to uh, to greener energy techniques. Requests. The support of all national uh, environmental agencies, for example, in assessing the current state of emissions. So this is an example of what all of those could look like. Um, and then at the end, you just conclude uh, the resolution with a period, basically. Uh, so it's as if the entire thing is one sentence and one thought. Uh, so yeah, once you've got this draft resolution completed, uh, the process for introducing the draft resolution, unlike the working paper, it's actually a vote that has to take place. Uh, so what happens is, you know, the basically you'll submit the draft resolution. It'll be sent to be printed. Once it's printed, it'll be brought to the committee and the director will say, like, there's a draft resolution that we have here. Does anyone want to introduce it? Typically, the people who wrote it will then motion, motion to introduce draft resolution 1.1 if it's the second one. Motion to introduce draft resolution 1.2. Uh, usually, they'll only be one point something because the first number is for the topic that you're addressing first, and then the next one is the number of the actual uh, resolution. So 1.1 is the first resolution on topic one, basically. Uh, so yeah, that's the way that you introduce the uh, draft resolution is through a vote, and once it's been voted. The director you know, will say this passes, it'll be handed out, there will be a break for people to read through it, um, and then there would be a question and answer session, which again is uh, sort of a removal from the formal structure of debate, uh, where the people who authored the draft resolution will come up to the dais, uh, they will, uh, the either the Depending on how the chair wants to do it, the chair will either call on people who have questions or uh, the people who are uh, doing the 
Q&A session will ask the questions and they will have a set amount of time between 30 seconds and a minute to answer each of the delegates' questions. Uh, one of the stipulations of this sort of thing is just, you know, questions be really concise and to the point and address all of those uh, and, and aren't trying to, you know, just they're, they're structural or factual or a, a question specifically about the resolution in that question and answer session just to make sure that everything stays on topic. Um, and so, yeah, they'll have a set amount of time to answer those questions. And a personal uh, pet peeve of mine, anyway, is just when a bunch of authors come up and not all of them, like only one or two of them, are answering the questions. Something that I'll do then is say, you know, I'd like for, you know, Japan to answer the next question because they haven't said anything during these uh, question and answer sessions. Uh, so the other delegates, the other delegates in the uh, committee will be asking the questions. So you'll come up to the dais, there'll be, you'll stand there, you'll look at the rest of the committee, and the committee will then pose questions to you about uh, what, what has been written and what they've just read in front of the committee. And then the people who will answer the questions are the people who have written the document. Yeah, so uh, the signatory, as I was saying earlier, the signatories are just people who wish to see it presented. They may not be the actual authors of the, uh, of the, of the draft resolution, um, but so the people who are uh, the authors should come forward to answer the questions that people have about it. Because obviously they wrote it, they know the most about it, they can work to clarify it. Yeah, so once you have this Q&A session is completed, you know, you can continue to have debate about specific draft resolutions. There may be multiple on the floor, playing them off one another. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention that typically there will be a limit for the number of draft resolutions and the number of working papers. Um, I know in my committee, I definitely won't accept more than uh, four working papers and then probably two, maybe three draft resolutions at the end. Just because you know you really want it to be not too redundant, like really have two working papers that are very different. Yes, I'm the I'm the chair of the environment program. I will be talking about ship breaking this year. Um, so yeah, there will be a certain limit on how many of these papers could be submitted, and then how many could be voted on in the end. Uh, uh, so the way that we will know who wrote it is basically, you know, we, we pay attention to these things and that like uh, when there is an unmoderated caucus, for example, we go around and we take note of uh, who is working together, for example, um, and we'll see. Uh, so the, the, the question was, how do, how do we know when, when we don't distinguish between authors and signatories, how will the executive board uh, identify the people who wrote it? And the answer is, you know, the, we expected people to be honest about this, and we expect people to, you know, come. The people that come forward during the Q and A session, those are the authors. Will also, you know, also be looking around during unmoderated caucuses to see who's writing this, everything. Um, and so we think we think that this, or that we know that this is a, uh, a a nice way to go about it, and that it encourages people uh, to be honest and not sort of squabble about whether or not they're formally a signatory on the paper. And just you know, you wrote it, you come forward, you answer questions about it, basically. <laughs> it's a brief question about uh, awards here. Uh, it depends on the size of the committee. Uh, larger committees typically have one best delegate, a and it's an outstanding, and maybe a few honorable mentions, I believe. Um, so yeah, there are a handful of awards for each committee, but uh, that's sort of a separate uh, question from the topic we're addressing currently. Um, so, uh, again, once you have completed a Q&A section on the uh, draft resolution, uh, the next phase uh, will be to go through some amendments. Uh, so, what happens there is just, you know, people will say, oh, you know, I want to add this one clause or I want to specify the language here. It doesn't really make as much sense. Um, and so all of those will be done 
through uh, a voting process. Uh, the way that I do this typically is I'll have a digital copy of the uh, draft resolution that'll be projected. Uh, and once they're and once it's on the projection, we can go through and begin to modify um, different parts, like track changes and modify places. And then typically all of the amendments will be voted on uh, toward the end, right before we go into the formal voting procedure. Uh, so yeah, uh, there was a question as to whether the ambulatory clauses and the operative clauses have to be related. Uh, no. The goals of those two are a little different. So the preambulatory clauses are to give context on, so it's, it's sort of similar to what you do in your uh, position papers actually, in that you start by going through and saying, here's the problem at hand, uh, here's all of the issues with it, here's what's been done in the past, these legislations, uh, and then go into, here's the action that this committee is actually going to take and here's what our stance is. Uh, so they don't have to be related, they're sort of doing different things um, about the topic area. And so if they were related, it might be a little bit confusing unless, you know, you, you, you want to avoid being redundant as much as possible in the, in the papers. Uh, so then we've arrived at voting procedure, uh, and voting procedure, the way it works, uh, obviously, is, you know, the vote to go into voting procedure, and then all of the current draft resolutions that are on the table are swept up into that and included. Uh, so, you know, the uh, dais will go and bar the doors, no one will be allowed in and out of the room. Um, and then uh, the voting will take place. It'll go resolution by resolution. People can motion for uh, a reordering of the way that the draft resolutions are being voted on, for example. And once that's been done, uh, all of the uh, all of the draft resolutions that are going to pass, and we only allow one to pass at H1 India, um, the one that passes will have to pass by a two-thirds um, majority of the committee, basically. Yeah, so a uh, question about how many people there are in the UNEP. There are about 80 people uh, in the UNEP, is my understanding. So yeah, I'm going to open the floor to just any questions that you have. Um, I'll stick around for about another 20 minutes to a half hour or so to answer people's questions. Um, so the, the format for writing an amendment um, basically all you have to do is say, so I'll actually, I'll write one on the same document that I've been working from, uh, and let me, got, let me know, do you guys need the, uh, tiny URL again? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, so the format for an amendment, basically, you know, you'll have, say, amendment, uh, to resolution, to draft resolution, One point one, and then all you have to say is, you know, in clause for replace emissions with carbon emissions. So that's an example of what an amendment can look like. Uh, Yeah, so does that help? I mean, there, there isn't really a formal um, way of doing it, but I mean, I, usually I accept amendments um, like on paper where people say like, I'd like you to change this part of the, um, change this part of this uh, clause to be something else. Uh, and that's usually a really effective way of going about it and that's part of why you know it's important to number your clauses is so that there's a way to quickly refer to each of them and we can easily find it because you know the amendment process can sometimes be long and drawn out and it's good to make it as efficient as possible so that you know everyone can feel really satisfied about the uh, the papers that are ultimately created. Uh, so another 
part of the fact that there aren't uh, sponsors for any of the resolutions is that there will be, um, there's no distinguishing between friendly and unfriendly amendments. Uh, and so what that means is that any amendments is put before the whole committee. And while, so there are the people that wrote the document that answered questions, the document is still reflective of being a production of the entire committee. Um, and so that's how it's treated. And any amendment, the entire committee will vote on that amendment. Um, so once, you know, that's something to think about when you're writing your draft resolution um, is that, you know, once it is uh, introduced, it is, it becomes a product of the entire committee and the entire committee can, you know, vote to modify it. Um, so that's something to consider and be aware of when you're creating the draft resolution, basically. Um, so, oh, and there was also a question, uh, will, will there be a oh, motion to set the agenda? Um, and, sorry, I didn't mean to delete that comment, but yeah, uh, there's a, a motion to set the agenda would be at the uh, beginning of the uh, beginning of the committee sessions. So if you, uh, they probably talked about this more in the uh, parli parliamentary procedure talk that they had, but at the beginning of committee, you'll have a, uh, you know, speakers about the various topics. And then once you've sort of debated and the committees come to consensus on which topic uh, you'd want to ha have discussed, then you can just uh, have a motion to set the agenda and vote on which topic you're going to talk about first, essentially. Um, that doesn't actually apply to my committee this year, though, just because there's only one topic that we'll actually be discussing, and uh, that is um, the, the shipbreaking topic, basically. So there won't be a agenda setting process. It'll just move directly into um, a speaker's list about that topic, essentially. Uh, there's no corollary for friendly or unfriendly amendments um, in our way of running Maldi Uh So amendments are, there's just amendments that happen that the entire committee votes on and the, uh, the resolution is treated as a product of the entire committee, basically. Um, yes, so for my committee, this is not true for everyone's committee, but for the UNEP this year, there's only one topic that will be discussed. And I know there's some confusion because there's a, a small typo that is in the position paper section, um, but it's only the shipwrecking topic that delegates are responsible for and that delegates have to write position papers for. Any other questions? So a, a committee can only pass one draft resolution because, you know, we want the, the language to be consistent and it's hard when, you know, you have two resolutions, for example, to make sure that they're addressing totally different aspects of the um, issue. So uh, the chairs will look much more favorably upon um, combining and collaborating with uh, respect to the draft resolutions than to passing that many. So again, the number of draft resolutions that will be uh, accepted, um, uh, the number of draft resolutions that will be accepted are, uh, depends on the committee. Um, and uh, in my case, you know, I'll accept two, maybe three, um, but other, uh, other directors will have different uh, specifications for the committees. Um, and so and the question is, what is, what is tabling a resolution? Um, I don't, uh, so you can table a topic for debate, but you don't ever table a draft resolution. Once it's introduced, it's kept on the floor until it's voted on. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what you mean by tabling a resolution for 4051. Um, yeah. 
So, uh, how many maximum sponsors does a draft resolution need? Uh, so again, there, there aren't any sponsors, they're just signatories. Um, I, think, uh, I mean, maximum, you could have the entire committee sign it, but I think the more important question is uh, the minimum. And this is something that is, you know, typically set at around between 10 to, depending on the size of the committee, you know, 10 to 15, 20% of the committee. So if you have, you know, 80 people and like uh, 10 or so people are signatories, then that would be enough. Um, again, this is something that kind of fluctuates with the size of the committee and it's something that at the beginning of uh, the conference, you know, your director will let you know, like how much it has, how many signatories you have to have in order for it to be uh, presented before the committee. Uh, yeah, there should be a document on uh, the uh, parliamentary procedure that should be available in the uh, you know, the substantive materials um, section of the website. Uh, I can look around a bit myself to see if I can find it. Um, oop, sorry. I'm down with a bit of cold here. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you go, if you're on the HMON India website, uh, you can see that there's a number of pieces here. Okay, there's a little bit about committee dynamics, which is sort of what I'm talking about, and working papers and resolutions. Uh, there should also be, I'll, I'll, um, yeah, I'll get back to you on the, um, yeah, it should be on the website for the, the procedure and the parliamentary procedure. Uh, so is it necessary to follow foreign policy while supporting a draft resolution? Um, yes, it is. It's always necessary to follow your foreign policy. Um, obviously, you know, there are some areas where you might be able to, you know, be a little more open and interpret what your country's policy is on a specific topic. Um, but you should always be sticking to the stance of your um, country. So, you know, if your country is very against something that is within that draft resolution, you, within the scope of debate, you know, you're obligated to either not support that draft resolution or to, um, yeah, to either not support the draft resolution or to try and amend it um, so that it will more favorably represent your country's policy, you know, because that, that's what people do in the real UN and that's what people, um, that's a part of the, that's part of making this you know a fun and exciting and real uh, really realistic simulation basically uh, yeah you do have to submit your working papers to uh, the dais um, you know it's part of the uh, it's part of the process and it's also so that you know they get presented before the entire committee so that people can kind of figure out who the other people are that have similar opinions on the topic and join up with them. Um, and it's also just so, you know, the director can, uh, the chair can keep an eye on, you know, how things are developing and making sure that, you know, things are um, accurate and progressing well. Um, so that's part of why, you know, the working papers are submitted to the, uh, the dais beforehand and then presented to the committee. Uh, so any, any links that go into this, I've discovered any links that you try and put in the, um, in the chat here will get blocked. So I, unfortunately I did not sure how to put a link to the portion of the website.
Any other questions? Uh, I think I'm going to need you to clarify that question a little bit. Um, what I will say here is that you know we uh, are very we really we don't support you know papers being written ahead of time is a large point. So you know all of the work that is done must be done uh, in during the committee session. Uh, oh, good point. Um, must be done during the committee session. Um, So, yeah, you the, the working papers should be submitted to um, the dance. during the committee session. Yeah, so this goes back to my point, uh, you might have missed it earlier about technology usage. So uh, you're allowed to work on your draft resolutions um, while, oh, you did, oh, you got the, you got the, okay. So I'm posting a link on the Google Doc that's just uh The Google Doc is not working. Oh no. Is it not letting you join it or I believe I've shared it with anyone that has the link can view it. So. Yes, you do have to submit your working papers to the dais during committee. Yeah, I know that there is a document on procedure. Um, just working to find it. Excellent question. What are working papers? Uh, so working papers are precursors to the draft resolutions that your committee publishes at the end. Uh, so the working papers are short summaries of what debate has covered so far and what the committee thinks are important about the topic. Uh, so they are, you know, they're not necessarily in formal term. They're not in the formal structure. They just kind of go through and say, these are the important points about um, our topic, and these are what we think are solutions and what we should do about them and our stance on it. 
Um, so there's sort of, you know, what emerges from debate um, after the first, you know, half of the uh, committee sessions, basically. Does that answer your question? And they're, they're submitted and they're what eventually combine and become the draft resolution. Uh, so this this has always been the time for the webinar. Uh, it may have been a little bit miscommunicated, um, but so if you missed the webinar and uh, you want to see it again, it's fine because I've recorded all of it uh, and it'll be available for you to watch later if you need it. Okay, link for the Google Doc is uh, tinyurl.com slash UNDP. So I, the only time that I would recommend um, preparing a speech is really for the opening. Uh, so when you're doing sort of the initial discussion of the topics or working on setting the agenda, um, mods is in moderated caucuses, I believe. Uh, so moderated caucuses, you know, should you prepare? Right, yeah. So should you prepare speeches for those? Um, only for the really the beginning one, just because, you know, the debate's going to emerge fluidly and there's no way for you to really prepare for what's going to be said. And it's a lot more impressive if you are sort of playing off the other people that are speaking in the debate rather than, you know, just saying always consistently the same thing that you started out with, basically. No, every delegate does not need to make a separate draft resolution. Um, the most important uh, part of what happens during the debate is that people come together to produce a collaborative and um, connected whole uh, draft resolution, basically. So every delegate does not produce their own draft resolution. Uh, you may not bring your laptops to the podium during the primary speaking list because that counts as a, uh, it's, it's part of formal debate or part of a moderated caucus. The only time when we're allowing technology is during the unmoderated caucuses. Uh, so, you know, uh, you should either memorize your initial speech or you should uh, have it on paper if you need that. Uh, so in terms of preparation for moderated caucuses, uh, I mean, the preparation that you should do is, uh, if, if you have a, a team, for example, um, you might practice doing some uh, moderated caucuses, for example, and just kind of get yourself familiar with the structure and with the um, flow of debate and sort of working to respond to people and paying attention and listening and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, the best way to prepare for Model UN is, ironically, to do it. <laughs> uh, so either, you know, practice with your team or if this is, you know, one of your, or if this is your first conference, you know, don't, don't sweat it too much. It's challenging at the beginning for everyone. Yeah, so practice. Uh, so, the position papers are something that you guys should be, so there's many different type of papers that we're talking about. There's position papers, and those, each delegate writes one. 
there's working papers, which are the first part of the committee, um, and they're made by a bunch of people, and then the draft resolutions, which finally get amended and voted on and published, basically. Um, so the way you make a position paper, um, you know, you do your research on the topic, you read the background guide for the committee, and then you take all of that information and you synthesize it together in uh, one paper. And um, and uh, so yeah, so the the structure, sorry, the structure of the position papers is basically you know you start with the uh, what the background on the topic is in general. Uh, so if you're talking about ship breaking and you're representing, you know, Bangladesh, for example, you talk about, uh, well, you talk about ship breaking in general, so how the industry started, how it's been working. Then the next paragraph would be all about uh, your committee and the topic. So you'd say, okay, you know, this is the committee that I am, I mean, this is, sorry, this is the country that I'm representing and this is how the topic directly affects that country. And then finally, the last paragraph will be, um, these are, you know, all of the steps uh, that we think are necessary in order to resolve or to advance uh, progress on the topic. And that's how you write a position paper. Um, you, uh, sending chits to the executive board does not get you points. Um, uh, I don't believe in the alphabetical order speaking, uh, you know, the way that I'll be calling on, and I'm sure the way all the directors will be calling on people is just making sure that it's, you know, balanced and that everyone who uh, takes initiative and wants to speak will get an opportunity to speak and in an uh, equal proportion throughout the debate. Um, but there's no point at which we would go through and say, okay, you know, letter A's start speaking. No, that's not how we go through it. Um, we would prefer that position papers not be more than one and a half pages. Um, and that's just because, you know, we really believe that you can get the salient points across in that amount of space. Um, and the goal is not to, you know, dazzle um, readers with the amount that you can write about the topic, um, but to really uh, communicate about it effectively. I, I would not recommend having the position paper be more than two pages. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. So uh, I mentioned the awards earlier again, uh, but there's, you know, a couple different levels. Best delegate, outstanding delegate, honorable mention, and the numbers of those change for each committee. Yeah, it's okay if they're two pages exactly, but again, if you can go through and just cut out half a page of something, and th I'm not, this doesn't include like your references. If your references are what's taking up that space, like that doesn't count. Um, so, yeah. Um, your approach while, while researching. Um, uh, again, this depends on the topic, uh, but I'd say, you know, your goal should be to get a working knowledge um, and some key points, salient points that you think that you would use in debate, uh, and then also, you know, a or just a, a good a good standing and a good understanding of what the topic area is. And of course, the background guide is a good place to start. Uh, each director has a section for future research for their committee that you should definitely you know look through most of the things that they mention there um, in order to gain more context. That's what I'd recommend in terms of uh, researching. All right, I'm going to end the broadcast in about five minutes. So if there are any last minute questions here. Um, yes, it's very important that you have references in your position papers. Yes, absolutely. You have to put references in the position papers. Um, so we are, yeah, endnotes. Uh, so we are, you know, very uh, we're, we're pretty, we're, well, we're very strict on the issue of plagiarism, uh, so we don't want anything that is, you put in there that is not your own words to be construed as being your own words. Yes, you need to provide citations in your position papers. 
Uh, so any sources that you use to get the information that eventually becomes a part of your uh, documented position or the position paper, you need to um, provide references for where it comes, it comes from. Uh, so a okay. So reliable sources are anything from books to you know uh, reputable websites, journal articles, uh, articles in uh, prestigious newspapers, for example. Um, you know, you can use articles in like one of my personal favorites is British broad Broadcasting Channel BBC. Um, they tend to have some great articles that are very relevant to various topics. Um, uh, endnotes are, are, yeah, endnotes are preferable. Uh, yeah, the background guide is sort of generally understood as your first point of reference. Um, and the actual citation for it can be like a little bit complicated, so you don't necessarily need to reference that. Um, and plus, you know, we kind of assume that you've read the background guide, so it's a lot more important to cite the other additional sources that you're using so that we understand that. Uh, I, I mentioned like the, the BBC, for example. Um, yeah, article, uh, journal articles. Um, so, those are sort of, you know, uh, peer reviewed. So like if you search your topic on Google Scholar, for example, you'll come up with a number of journal articles. Yes, uh, so citations. Um, we typically use MLA citation style. So that is, um, you can feel free to search this. Feel free to yeah Google for an MLA citation guide. I'm going to put one of my favorites in the um, in the Google Doc again. So we've got a citation guide there now. So if we don't do anything else, um, I mean, you should be doing research outside the background guide. That's something that we expect as part of the preparation for the conference. Um, so you should read the background guide and then go from the background guide to do more research to learn more about the topic. And once you do that, um, then cite what you've read when you write your background, when you write your, excuse me, when you write your position paper. It's a lot of documents. <laughs> All right, any last minute questions? Um, otherwise, you know, I can be reached at uh, this email, UNEP uh, at uh, I, understand, I understand your question if you don't, but my point is that you should. <laughs> Uh, 
I mean, if you really didn't use any other sources to create your position paper, then you wouldn't cite anything, but you should do more research. There's not a co-director in any of the committees. Um, total suggested time for research. I mean, you should research until you feel comfortable in the topic area. Uh, I'm not going to say, you know, you must spend like X number of hours on it because um, it's all to your level of, you know, comfort and feeling that you can uh, be able to debate effectively with the knowledge that you've acquired. I'm just looking up the what the last date for the position papers is. Uh, so the conference-wide deadline for the position papers is August 6th. Oh yeah, someone else got it. Okay, August 6th. Yeah, you should include citations in your the end of end notes of your position papers. Um, and it's really easy in. Microsoft Word to add those at the end. Um, maintaining column while it's with committee. You know, uh, I definitely agree that sometimes the committee sessions can uh, be a little bit daunting and a little bit scary at times. Um, but the most important thing is to, you know, keep in context and that, you know, you are at this to learn and to have fun and to meet people and to gain experience. Um, and so it's not, you know, something that you have to get stressed out about. It's something that, you know, it's, it's meant to be fun and it's meant to be educational. Um, and if, you know, you're ever feeling like you're not calm and like you need, then that's something that you can, you know, absolutely come to your director about if there's something that's concerning you during committee. Um, so yeah, keep it in perspective, <laughs> I suppose. All right. an excellent question. I think he, I think he actually, I think he shot this left actually, unfortunately. <laughs> I can, I can check real quick before I sign off though. Maybe. I don't know. Ah, how to tackle power delegates. Well, I mean, this is something that Certainly, you know, is a challenge, um, but it's something that, you know, especially for, uh, it's partially the job of the, you know, the committee staff as well, um, to acknowledge if someone is, uh, you know, monopolizing the debate a little bit and making it hard to, for other people to have opportunities to speak and contribute, then that's something that the director can work to settle. And if there's ever, you know, someone's behavior that you, you're concerned about, then you can absolutely, you know, tell the director about that. Um, Ah, excellent questions about the shipbreaking topic. Um, so this is something that I've been telling everyone who has asked me questions about, you know, the relevancy of shipbreaking to your country. And I'll take a minute to just kind of draw the larger implications. Uh, in that, you know, shipbreaking, obviously it's a very specific industry, but it has a lot of implications in terms of, you know, what is the policy on international movement of transboundary trans wastes? How do you define what waste is? Um, what are some other, you know, if 
uh, Algeria has other sort of environmentally damaging industries that are going on. Again, I'm not exactly familiar with Algeria, but I'm sure that you can find this um, and sort of figure out what their policies are toward that and sort of what's its policy toward global recycling, toward environmental policy in general. In that I, I really like this topic area because while some countries don't necessarily have it uh, directly connected to them, there's a lot of ways that you can figure out the implications of what they might consider, how they might consider this topic area. And that, you know, if a country is accepting a lot of waste um, frequently, then they, uh, if, if a country is accepting a great deal of, of other types of waste, then they might feel that this industry is very important uh, to the economy, or they might feel that, you know, it's exploiting their countries, for example. Um, so even though it's a very specific topic area, uh, you should you know, find out about the environment. You know, uh, what do directors look for in delegates? Uh, we look for, you know, effective presentation, effective communication skills, and most importantly, you know, the ability to collaborate and help to make other, you know, make other delegates look good as well. Um, at least in my opinion, uh, you know, so being being a, a, a good citizen of the committee um, and also, you know, contributing and really guiding the focus of what of what's being discussed, essentially. So good position paper should include exactly those four sections that I have talked about at the beginning. Uh, you know, you should have the um, you should have the background of the topic, then you should have the uh, topic as it's relevant to your country, and then finally the uh, proposed solutions that you have. Yeah, so finding out about Algeria's environment, for example, that will then allow you to understand what their stance on environmental policy is. And so that they will likely be taking that from their domestic context to an international context when talking about ship breaking as to whether or not they support it or how they support it. And especially since, you know, Algeria is also a developing nation. They'll have, you know, various um, perspectives from, from that uh, stance essentially as to whether or not they feel that ship breaking should continue and whether or not it's important. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to sign off here. Uh, have to go to work today. Um, but it's been wonderful uh, discussing the draft resolution and working paper process with all of you. Uh, and if you have any other questions about the topic or about uh, this webinar, uh, again, if you missed part of it, it'll be available on re recorded. Uh, and feel free to email me at uh, unep at hmanindia.org. Thank you very much.